Thank you for uh, sending over these nice shoes I got. <laughs> and um, thank you for this. You Very could nice. afford. How come you're not wearing any of them? I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed, I'll be honest with you. Okay. And you know, they're available on the website as well, too. Really? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. You're very comfortable. These are going to make me run faster. Is that right? Make you jump a little higher, run a little faster, and really? be a lot more secure in your everyday okay. living. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kevin, for coming. Um, you obviously have a big fan club, and uh, we've had, uh, you know, a lot of people wanted to come to this because obviously people admire a, a local boy who's made good. And let's talk about your company that you started, Under Armour. But first, before we talk about the company, let me ask you about some of the videos we just saw. You had some of the great athletes that you uh, sponsored. Um, take uh, Stephen Curry, great basketball player. You pay him a fair amount of money, I guess, to wear your shoes, yeah. and he likes them. But if he comes over your house and wants to play horse, does he let you win because you're paying him a lot of money every year? <laughs> I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be troubled if, he let, if, he, if I won a game of horse against Stephen Curry, that'd be a problem. What about, like, you want to swim with Michael Phelps, does he let you win or no? I don't know if I'd try that. <laughs> what about Tom Brady? Does he throw you the balls soft or something like that? Or? <laughs> I think these guys have only one speed. I actually had, a, uh, I had the privilege of playing golf with, uh, it, was, it was one of those foursomes that you can only dream about, and I got to play golf with, with Jordan Spieth, who's one of our golfers. Uh, Stephen Curry and uh, President Obama. Wow. And uh, in that foursome, so this is the way that I sort of approach sports, and in that foursome, I was lucky enough to be able to pair with Jordan because Stephen is a scratch golfer and President Obama doesn't have a job, so he has a lot of time on his hands. Right. So, and unfortunately, uh, Jordan would have needed possibly close to a hole in one on every hole for us to be able to take the match. So we gave that match back, but someday we'll get our golf game. So there. were you the best of the four golfers there? Or? Uh, by handicap, perhaps, but not even close. Okay. <laughs> so you haven't, how come you haven't signed up Tom Brady's wife, Giselle? She's not an athlete or? Uh, she, she fits about every bill, but uh, yeah, I think we've had a great relationship with Giselle and Tom, so they're, they're, they're a super couple and, and wonderful okay. people and proud to have them wearing our gear when, whenever so, they exercise. Um, if you could be a great athlete like the ones you just mentioned, Michael Jordan or Stephen Curry or Michael Phelps or Tom Brady, or you could be the CEO of an athletic apparel company, what would you rather do? Be a great athlete or be the CEO? I take the CEO every day of the week. I mean, you, but, but uh, maybe not every day of the week, but you have, we, yeah, I don't know. It's actually, that's probably a better question than I gave it credit for. Um, okay. I mean, like not sports, sure. you still get hit like in sports. Uh, they still write about it afterwards, what happens, but you really have four games a year okay. with earnings calls and, and all the work is done long before the press release, that's for sure. So what year did you start Under Armour? 1996, from about a mile from where we're sitting right now in a little row house in Georgetown on 35th Street. When you started the company, do you ever think you'd build one of the biggest athletic apparel companies in the world? I never had a, I never believed we couldn't do that. Like when I started, I never, I never thought, I, I don't know if people begin with this massive vision at you know, 22 or 23 years old, but my belief when I started was I was gonna build the world's greatest t-shirt for football players to wear under their pads. It was very much a, a distance of how far we could see. And from there, they said, well, we make the best shirt for uh, football players, but what if we made them long sleeve shirts? And what if we made something for cold weather in addition to warm weather? And it was really the, it was, it was one, uh, one product at a time, uh, one ask from the consumer at a time to satisfy a, a need. So let's talk about how you actually came up with the idea of starting a company. Uh, you grew up in Kensington, Maryland, in the suburb of Washington. Yeah. And uh, you went to high school uh, at Georgetown Prep, yeah. which is a place where a lot of Supreme Court justices have come out of recently, right? Yeah. So did you ever aspire to be on the Supreme Court? Well, I was, we, we came to a mutual agreement to leave Georgetown Prep after my sophomore year, okay. right. not fully knowing about what was happening with the Supreme Court justice process, but I then made the decision to go to the Christian Brothers at St. John's my junior year of high school. Okay, so, so it was decided you, would, you weren't going to be an uh, academic star, but you might be an athletic star. <laughs> I, I, I believe I could do both, but it was, okay. All right. I but took you were, what I could get at the time. You were a good football player. I was, good, I was a good high school football player. Okay, and what positions did you play? I played fullback and linebacker. Okay, and so you get an athletic scholarship to college to play or not? Originally? I did not, so I went, 
Go ahead. So where did you initially, after you graduated from high school, you then went to where? A place called Fork Union Military Academy. Okay, and is that well known for? Wow, there's a, there's a. <laughs> so were there a lot of other good football players there? So it actually, it's, it's, it's Fork Union actually became really the impetus for starting Under Armour because between um, my high school team at St. John's, we had a really good team. We won the city championship that year. Uh, we had about nine guys in our team that went on to play Division I football. Uh, at, at, at Fork Union, at University of Maryland, there were 25 guys playing in the NFL at any given time. At, at Fork Union, I went to this class, and it's a one-year prep school class, uh, down about 40 miles outside of, of Charlottesville, Virginia. And in the class, we started with 135 guys on a football team, which was a one-year prep team that had 11 starting spots on each side of the ball. Uh, by the end of three days in August, there were 65, roughly, people left on that team. Of that 65, 23 signed Division I-A scholarships. Uh, 13 wound up getting drafted into the NFL, and four of them became first-round draft picks. And one guy won the Heisman Trophy and somebody named Eddie George. So the ability to start Under Armour was more of, oh my gosh, I've got this massive network of between high school and prep school and college of 40, 50 you know, friends of mine that were playing in the NFL that had a shelf life about three to four years of the time that they had last in the NFL. So what can I do to not be the obnoxious third cousin to call and ask for a thousand dollar loan, but just simply to say, I got a product, I'm gonna send you three shirts, uh, I've got this idea, if you like it, wear it, and if you really like it, give one each guy in the locker next to you. All right, so you have somebody who won the Heisman Trophy on your high school team, Eddie George, he was pretty good, I assume. He could play. Right, right. okay. <laughs> Then you, could you tackle him, or did you ever tackle him? Or? I tackled him with, with help before, okay. yeah. All right, all right. So um, you were ready to get a Division I football scholarship, but the Division I was not ready to give you one. Correct. So you went to University of Maryland, but you walked onto the team. Yeah, I disagreed with that assessment, but yeah. So I, I, we, we, we sort of marched and cut our own course, and uh, I went on the team. And, all right, so you played all four years? I did. And so how many people walk on and actually play all four years? Is that uncommon? Uh, it's probably unusual, but I think they made a mistake. I think I should have had the scholarship long before. Okay, but well, I thought the same thing at Duke. I thought I should have gotten a football scholarship, but that didn't work out. So um, I should have walked on. Now so, you can qualify with uh, the gear that you have I got today. The, okay, yeah. so let's talk about this. All right, so while you're there, you need to make or you want to make some money on the side. You set up a program that seems pretty creative to me to uh, send out roses to people on Valentine's Day. Uh, what was the essence of that business? I, my freshman year, this guy uh, I knew told me he was gonna start a rose business, and I went, he asked me if I would drive, and I knew the area, and I was local to Maryland. So I went and drove for him, and I realized his business was a disaster. I showed up, he didn't have me get there till two o'clock in the afternoon, it was a Friday, it was rush hour, and I thought I could build this business much better than he did. So my redshirt freshman year at the University of Maryland, I started a rose business, sought out to sell 100 dozen flowers, $25 each plus a $5 delivery charge, $3,000 gross. The flowers cost about 15 cents a stem, so it was a nice way to make $1,000 or $1,500. My sophomore year, we sold 250 dozen. Three, my junior year, 600 dozen. My senior year, 1,186 dozen flowers. And I remember that number because I was trying to sell 1,500 dozen flowers. Right. And nothing like watching 314 dozen of opportunity die on you, so. But why did you uh, only do it one day a year? Did you think of other days you could have sold roses or other things, or just, that was enough? Well, I was an athlete, and so, so I, had, I had football to get into, and so most kids were down at Mardi Gras, and I actually okay. stayed in, and All right, so you, you graduated, and when you graduated, nobody, uh, the NFL didn't draft you, I assume, right? No, okay. I had to make other plans. All right, so they made a mistake, they didn't draft you, so. No, they uh, were right, they were right. <laughs> So um, what did you decide to do? You wanted to build um, a company, but where was the idea that came to your head about having a, let's say, a T-shirt that would be better for football players? Where was the idea, gen uh, genesis of that? Probably the, the, the superpowers that I was looking for from gear, is that as an athlete, I, I never understood why we'd wear a short sleeve cotton T-shirt in the summer and a long sleeve cotton T-shirt in the winter. And the way that everyone had viewed apparel in the past had been as just another T-shirt. 
versus viewing it like a piece of equipment. And so a cotton t-shirt dry would weigh six ounces. When it got wet, it could weigh up to three pounds. So as an athlete playing 70, 80 plays in a game, or God forbid, going both ways, I thought there was this way to create apparel to make it truly a piece of equipment that could help enhance your performance and make you better. And I sweat like a pig, so I needed, uh, I needed okay, to Okay, all right, so how did you go about the idea of designing something or getting somebody to help you design something that would do what you wanted to do? Where did you go? Uh, the, the first place is I went to a local fabric store and I brought in a, a really a piece of, for lack of a better word, is women's lingerie. And I said, do you make anything like this of this synthetic stretchy material? Because it was like the girdles that we wore in the lower half of our body and said, what if you made that for the upper body? And uh, the woman at the store at Minnesota Fabrics in College Park, she handed me a bolt of fabric and I bought what she had. I then took this stretchy synthetic fabric to a, a local tailor in Beltsville, Maryland, and I brought in a tight little white Hanes t-shirt and I said, sir, can you make me as many t-shirts that look like this, but out of this fabric? And uh, seven prototypes later, I took them back to my teammates at University of Maryland in the spring of 96, and okay. uh, they tried them, they liked them, and All right, so it they made the equipment for you, the, the, the uh, t-shirt, how, how did you sell it? Where did you go to sell it? I started with the guys and found out, will this idea hold? And the players at Maryland said that they loved them. Where could they get more? And I then knew I needed to learn how to manufacture, so I'd read about this place called the Garment District in New York City. I got in my 92 Ford Explorer and drove up to 34th and 5th Avenue, parked my car, and found a place that could buy fabric. I found a place that could manufacture, and I made my first run of 500 shirts, and then sent three t-shirts out to everybody that I knew and ever played with. And your car was still there when you came back, right? <laughs> No, it was actually towed the first time. <laughs> it was expensive. So, okay. All right, so you, you have the garment, it's being manufactured, and then your job is to go on the road and basically sell it to athletes, more yeah. or less, or teams. So was that hard? I put 48 and 51,000 miles on my car in 97 and 98, respectively, and then I started working my way up to airplane tickets and things like that to move around. But yeah, I did do these great tours, but that's a lot of miles. Now, you are the youngest of five brothers? Yeah. So did your older brother say, you're crazy and go get a job? Or what did they say about this? A little bit of that. <laughs> Not really that nice, but no, they said it. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I had, I had a tremendous amount of support from my family, it was great. great. And, but everybody had their own thing. And so I was doing my thing. And Under Armour was, you know, it wasn't obvious. You know, people started and they'd call and they'd trip over the name as, you know, what's that thing you're doing? Armor All, you know, Under Arm. You know, they would Well, by the way, where did, up, the, so. where did the name come from? It wasn't intuitive until about seven years in. It was actually one of my brothers when I was going to actually name the company and call it, uh, I wanted to call the company Body Armor. And this is from, I'd been through, I wanted to call the company Heart. I thought that'd be a great name. You know, you keep heart here, you wear heart in your sleeve. Like, I thought it was a good name. I had a friend that worked at the Patent Trademark Office, a guy named Patrick Herson, and uh, he ran all of my searches for me. This is before the internet. And uh, that name came back full. And then I was going to name the company Body Armor. And I, was not good with the secret, and I started telling people I'm gonna call the company Body Armor. There was about a two week hold between telling people or announcing the name and actually finding out if I could get it. And in that time, I came back and I found out there's two ballistic vest manufacturers called Body Armor. There's a body shop in New Jersey called Body Armor, you'll never get it through. And I went to go see um, uh, my oldest brother, and he was an architect, and he was at his desk, and he said, you ready to go to lunch? He said, yeah, he said, how's that thing you're working on? I said, well, what's that? He said, uh, what do you call it, Under Armour? And I said, Under Armour. I said, I can't do lunch. I got to go. I went home. <laughs> but filled out the he, paperwork, bought the 8800 number and the website. And but did he tell you that Armour is spelled A-R-M-O-R? Yes, but for an 800 number, because I didn't know if this internet thing was going to stick in 96. 8884-A-R-M-O-U-R <laughs> or 8884-4-A-R-M-O-R. So I opted for the old English okay, version. All right. So you started. You got the name of the company. Where'd you get the money initially? From the uh, Rose business, or you got investors? Where'd you get your initial money? Investors. Yeah, I had this is before private equity, but I had seventeen thousand dollars in startup capital that I used, uh, and then it was just friends and family. And there were moments of selling, you know, a percent in the company or five percent of the company for five thousand dollars. It was whatever we could do just to get the company started. Just. Some so, way, somehow, all right, find so a when way. you're starting this company, does uh, Phil Knight of uh, Nike call you up and say, hey, by the way, it, there's, it's too competitive in this business, you shouldn't get into this business? Or did he ever pay attention to you? I don't know. Yeah, he, he wasn't paying attention to you. Uh, I mean, we have, you always have interests. And so I, I thought about the number of times that we've been 
um, talked about buying acquisitions, things like that. And I've always had a very simple philosophy is that if anyone ever offered us an amount of money, as I'm a fiduciary first and foremost as a, to my shareholders, if anyone ever offered me an amount of money greater than what I believed I could get the company to, I wouldn't be my choice, it'd be my obligation to do, make the right decision. But okay. I have yet to see that happen. So, okay. so we go back to work every day. All right, so you're growing the company. What other products did you, line extensions they would call them, what other products did you build? Uh, we let the consumer lead us. It was, you know, we have a, a saying at Under Armour is that, you know, we've yet to build our defining product as a brand. And so that's something that challenges everyone in our, our, our product teams, our marketing teams, is making sure um, that they're working toward the next great innovation. And it's the consumer who tells us. You know, our first product began as a tight-fitting T-shirt for, 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 for the summer, and all of a sudden it was, can you make something for warm weather? Can you make long sleeves? Could you make shorts? And then you have this ethos or essence that becomes the brand that needs to translate through every product that we build. And it comes, the essence and that consistency, that continuity which makes, that's right. what brand is. And so whether it is a, a shirt or a short or a shoe, it must all feel Under Armour. That should feel, you know, that should, should feel as great next to skin without a sock on it because it's Under Armour and it should keep you cool and it should breathe and it should have balance and recovery and everything about it should be making you better, which is the but, mission we have today. But can an athletic shoe really make me run faster? It's all relative, David. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, okay, but I mean, I guess it makes a little difference, right? It only takes a little difference to make. Yeah, especially when you get to that elite level and the shoe you're wearing, I mean, it's a connected shoe, which is one of the first connected or the only connected running shoe ever built, which means it has a chip in it that you don't have to take your phone for a run to track where you're going. And so that shoe actually has an app that comes with it. You download the app, you can leave your phone at home, you can walk outside, it could tell you your distance, your split, uh, your cadence, uh, in your gait, and so the distance is how far, and it can make recommendations. You could run faster if you shortened your gait, lengthened your gait, and gives real-time coaching. And so it's really, um, and it ties into our connected fitness platform, which today has okay. over 250 million people as a part of it. Well, I'm sure I could run faster by eight less or whatever else, but probably that's not the major factor. It won't, it won't, won't critique you, you. it'll just encourage you. So um, what about great athletes? Now, when you try to sign up these athletes, everybody knows since Michael Jordan, well, I guess Stan Smith had a famous t uh, tennis shoe uh, that was made by Adidas, I guess. It still it does. And yeah. still, it's still out there. And then Michael Jordan's shoe became famous. So everybody realized if you have an athlete endorse a, show, a shoe, it can help sell the shoe. Um, but to get these athletes to do this, you have to basically pay them money, right? They don't do it for free. They for, it's, it's nice when they start because they love the brand, because they love the product. And so, you know, Jordan Spieth is a great example of an athlete who, you know, he wore, he's an athlete, he played football and baseball and basketball growing up, and he loved Under Armour. And that's why he wanted to sign with our brand. You know, Stephen Curry was, you know, an athlete who came to us who was, he'd already signed one con NBA contract with, with Nike, and then he made the decision to switch to Under Armour. And so there's a certain type of athlete that decides to be an Under now, Armour. Now, how did he decide to pick Under Armour over the others? Truth be told, it was actually his, his three-year-old daughter, Riley, at the time, who <laughs> made the decision. So this is actually a pretty cool story. So uh, Stefan, when making the decision, he had offers from all three brands. And Stefan was, you know, the seventh pick in the, in the draft, and his three years had gone by, and he didn't feel he was getting the love, really, from uh, the brand he was with at the time. So to make the decision, he put all three shoe boxes with a shoe on top, each shoe that we had projected for him. And uh, he said, you know, Riley, I need to help make this choice. Tell me what you think. And he sent his, maybe she was one or two, actually. And she got up and sort of hobbled over there. And she picked up the first shoe, which is the Adidas shoe. She picked it up, looked at it, threw it over her shoulder. And she sort of waddled over to the, the, the second uh, uh, Nike shoe and picked it up and threw it over her shoulder. And then she picked up the Under Armour shoe, walked back and said, this one, Daddy. Wow. So, and did yeah. you have to pay her, too? or just I mean, we might. <laughs> It's not a bad idea. No? I wish you were that easy today. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, all right, so the athlete has to like the, the product, but obviously uh, they like to be compensated for it. But in the end, uh, you know, when children or young adults are buying athletic equipment or yeah. apparel, they might be induced to do so by uh, Michael Jordan endorsing it. But for somebody my age or older people, are they really going to be induced to buy something because Michael Jordan in, uh, endorses it? Or really, it does work for people like me? Are we targeting you? Well, I'm not, we'd like you. I'm artist. not saying we, we are or we're not, but our mission statement says to make athletes better. And our ambition for doing that is when you can outfit the best and people that really care about every 
every ounce, every nuance of a product that okay. comes in. I think that trust is something that builds credibility, that allows the okay. inspiration. Because do you care or not? But it's nice to know that the very best, this is what they choose to wear when they're performing at the highest level. Now, the products, where are the products made? There's a perception that all these athletic uh, pro products are in apparel are made, let's say, in Asia. They're all made at the same kind of places. And uh, these people are paid very low wages. And uh, in the end, the same factory makes things for you, Nike, and Adidas. Is that true or not? I think that the, the global manufacturing process is something that is, uh, it's, it's, it's critical to, I think, growing and creating, you know, second world and first world economies. You watch what's happened in China of the elevation of the minimum wage. When I made my first trip to China in 1999, uh, you know, Guangzhou was a hot manufacturing bed. Today, Guangzhou is the number three tier one city in all of China. And it's been that transition that it got there through manufacturing. So I think it's something, it's, it's all relative, but you know, this is something we take great pains that we do when we're evaluating, making sure that okay. the shops are, meet the standards and uh, deliver things the way that we'd want them to be delivered. But sometimes your products are made in the United States or not? Of course. It's a very small percentage today. We gave up on that a long time ago. So let's talk about Baltimore. Uh, you're from the uh, Washington suburbs, Kensington initially, and you went to the University of Maryland, which is yes. in College Park, a more or less a suburb of Washington. Why did you decide to locate the headquarters of your, uh, your company in Baltimore, which is my hometown, it's a great city, but wasn't a natural place for you to locate a headquarters, or was it? I think two things. Number one, there was, the, there was something about the grid of the city that was appealing to me. Of, remember, I moved there in August of 1998, made the decision to move from, from Georgetown with my, my partner, Kip Falks, and uh, when we moved, it, it, it felt like it was sort of a fresh breath. It felt like it was, um, the grid of Baltimore was sort of this, this, this lunch pail, work boot, um, you know, chip on your shoulder. And that's really what I wanted the brand to be. And so there was a reflection there. The second thing was being the youngest of, of five boys, you know, growing up here. I had a lot of history in this town. It was nice just to get a fresh start in Baltimore as a place that was close enough to mom, but far enough away to right. really start with a clean sheet of paper. So no skeletons in your closet in Baltimore, right? No, it was, it was starting over and starting okay. fresh and building something great. So um, today, how many employees do you have in, uh, around the world? Uh, a little more than 14,000 14,000. How many are in uh, Baltimore area? So when Kip and I moved, it was Kip and I, we're, we, we went there with two employees, and then today there's probably 3,500, uh, 4,000 between corporate and one of our main warehouses that we have there as well, called Distribution now, House. You've been very involved in philanthropy uh, in many different areas, but one is in Baltimore, and now you outfit, at your own cost, uh, the athletes of all the Baltimore City public schools. Is yep. that right, more or less? Yeah, what I think is neat is, the unique thing about an Under Armour is that we have the ability to connect with kids in a way that other brands don't. And so, you know, a bank or an insurance company, it's, it's nice, but kids want to be around our brands. So we have the ability to take advantage of that. And so the things that we do to activate is, you know, we have things that every, every one of our teammates, as we call them, contributes 32 hours a year. And we have something we call Armor Days, which we did one this year. Uh, we put 12,000 hours of, of, of man and woman power together to actually transform three middle schools in Baltimore City. Uh, we built a rec center called UA House on Fayette Street. Um, outfitting all of the high schools is critical. And then for me personally, the ability to touch you know, up to 500 uh, kids through summer programming, uh, tuition assistance, college graduate, education in college, uh, and other things, as well as there's somebody here named Joe Jones from the Center for Urban Families that works with uh, formerly incarcerated individuals that Thank get brought you. out. So the ability to actually affect both lives before and lives that need another opportunity right. are some of the things I think that we're taking on and really right. trying to make a difference of in Baltimore City. All right, so you started your company in 1997, is that right? Six. Six. And you took the company public in 2005. Five. At the IPO, um, when you price an IPO, the theory is you want the investors to make some money so they buy it at a price A, and it goes up by 10 or 15%. Yeah. So they feel good that the first day they, they're up 10 or 15%. So the underwriter's job is to price it so it goes up a little bit. Yeah. Um, your underwriters uh, priced it in a way where your stock went up on the first day 100%. So did you leave a lot of money on the table, or what? Potentially, but what the bankers will tell you is that going public, and what I'll tell other entrepreneurs going public, it is the starting line. But I'll tell you, leaving that much money on the table certainly wasn't ideal. And it was an email that I got from a, a certain private equity of somebody that you know, 
uh, well, I don't know if I'll use their name, but he sent me an email because we had this great meeting and he said, oh my gosh, I love the company. On the IPO, it was our second or third to last meeting after 77 one-hour, one-on-one meetings on the, on the road show. And um, uh, I said, I really like this guy. I told the bankers, I said, he, they need a bigger allocation. Give him a bigger allocation. He said, oh, he's a smaller fund. You shouldn't give him the big allocation. I said, no, I'm mandating you do it. At this point, they're saying, okay, fine, we'll give him a bigger allocation. I then get an email two days after the IPO. It just said, you know, dear Kevin, I uh, love meeting you. Thanks so much. Congratulations on your brand. Unfortunately, you blew through all of our investment parameters, so I had to sell everything. And he doubled his price, basically, and sold out of the stock the next day, which was a great lesson of sort of going public is that a trade is a trade. So the market is, it doesn't see that potential. It sees, here's my investment parameters, and here's your PE, and here's how we're going to- so In other words, he didn't love you, he just wanted to get a little money and- well, he, 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 he did what, what hedge funds did, is he made money. Okay, all right, so the first day the stock goes up 100%, that's, I guess, makes you feel good. On the other hand, you left a lot of money on the table, but your company's in good shape. And then for, uh, I think it's roughly 26 consecutive quarters, yeah. Your, your uh, revenue went up 20% a quarter. Yeah. So that's very unusual to keep going up that way. Um, at what point did you realize you just couldn't keep doing that? I, you know, we had a great run from 2010 through 2016, roughly. You know, with that kind of growth was something that had never really been seen in, in consumer retail before. We were, you know, we've, we achieved crossing 500 million or a billion or, um, you know, faster than any other brands had done in our space. And in our industry, there's only two, now three or four companies that have crossed the $5 billion threshold. And when the other companies didn't, they didn't have a, you know, 25 or $35 billion juggernaut sort of above them. Um, that run was one where, you know, I think we had a lot of, a lot of ideas of how, of how large we could be. And doing that, it never took away from how great that we knew the company could be right. either. And that's always the focus. You want to build a great brand. But in doing it, when you have that opportunity is grabbing, we called the, the era for us was called Get Big Fast. And Get Big Fast was in 2013, we were a $2.3 billion company. And we effectively, from 13 to 16, we went from 2.3 to $4.8 billion. So we more than doubled the size of our company in less than three years. And that puts all kinds of strain because this isn't software that just leverages out the backside. This is infrastructure and facilities and boxes and buildings and a lot of things that we you know, I think we made a great run, and I think we allowed to put ourselves in a position of scale that's allowed us to really live through the last two years in a place that's stronger than we could have ever been had we not grown at that rate. Your company was growing quite nicely. The stock price was going up. In fact, today your market value is about $9.5 billion, more or less, but it was almost double that at one point. Yeah. So did you, when it started going this way, did you think you had to reinvent your company, or what did you decide to do? I think every company Every great company, every great brand will come to a crossroads where they have to decide how are you going to attack it. And I believe that that's something that we've taken on. We'll call it a transformation. And as we've said publicly is that we're roughly two years through, we'll call it a three-year transformation. And that meant a lot of restructuring charges, a lot of reorganizations. We had to unfortunately do some rifts in our company. And in going through all that process, it's made us a better and stronger company. And I think about the three things that we've leaned on, which has been people, process, and product. And people, it begins with my new partner. I brought in a, a new COO and president named Patrick Frisk. Um, he's coming up on 18 months and has been excellent helping us transform, implement a go-to-market process, deliver a, a new operating model, really just getting our structure and getting, I think, our costs in line so that we can be as excellent and profitable on the bottom line as we've been able to demonstrate we can do for growth on the top line. And then process has been implementing new systems, getting our people aligned to that, and then Whoever makes the best product is going to win. And so that's one thing we know that regardless of everything else, if we make great product, like we recently did with this footwear called Hover that we've launched into the world, um, the consumer is going to choose it and, and, and we'll, we'll be there and we have a, we have a real chance. So uh, you are not in the athletic equipment business, unlike some of your competitors. Like uh, I think, uh, let's say Nike, they make some athletic equipment. Why are you not in that business? You're in the apparel business. That's a, equipment's a tough business and there's lower margins. It's not as not as compelling or attractive. And I think that we effectively believe that we bring equipment. Our footwear is not just another shoe. It's a shoe that comes with an app. It's a shoe that actually will help coach you to make you better. Our apparel isn't just apparel that wears because it's stylish or cool. It should be stylish or cool, but what makes it great, that jacket you're wearing is lined with salient, which actually helps increase your blood flow and helps your muscles recover faster to put you in better shape for tomorrow. Okay, now. All right, I'm feeling the blood flowing already. Yes. Uh, um, so, 
Now, a number of years ago, one of your competitors, Nike, uh, they began to have their own stores, Nike stores. Now, you have your own stores, right? Yeah. So you have a number in the Washington area and I guess around the country. So do you sell more products there than you do with the regular retailers you sell your products through? It's a combination. In the United States, we have a, 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 a really good wholesale system. So partners like Dick's Sporting Goods or Hibbit Sports or Foot Locker and Finish Line, people like that. In, Around the world, you don't have that. And so you go to different markets. In China, there is no sporting goods channel. There is no way to get your product out there. So this past spring, we opened store number 1,000 around the world, actually in Mexico City. By the end of next year, we'll open another two to 300 stores in 2019 moving forward, the majority of which will be in China. But we have that balance and the ability, frankly, to control your destiny because dealing through a wholesaler is difficult unless you really have the ability to well, articulate clearly how you want to show up and how you want to present the brand. You, you so we have the ability to do that our own, in our own stores. Now in China, very often if, when I'm there, I sometimes see knockoffs of American uh, goods and so forth. Are yeah. there knockoffs there that you have to worry about or is that not a problem there? We've had several lawsuits and it's, I, just, I don't know if I'm the lawyers would like, but it's, you, you're striving for that moment where people want to knock you off and then all you want to do is protect yourself obviously when you can, but we've had some crazy lawsuits that have gone back and forth, and they've resolved, and the Chinese courts have been great to us, too, so. So let's talk about, for a moment, how your, uh, your culture of your company. You were in the news recently for uh, the, the, the nature of your inclusion and not including certain people in your company. Can you address the culture issue? So we've, the hard thing with building a business is that the first thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to build a house. I wanted to build a great house. And as you grow, you realize that house has become a building and it's gotten a tall building. And the first thing is that for any entrepreneur is that as the CEO, I am fully responsible for everything that happens in my company. But what I'm required to do and where I'm accountable for is the actions we take when bad things happen. And I think we've been incredibly proactive when it comes to issues that, uh, that arise. And this is something that's gonna happen in any organization the size of 14,000 plus. And so, We'll continue to make that, we'll continue to be proactive, and we'll continue to invest into our culture to make sure it is inclusive, it is diverse, um, it is something that is, it is, it is an equal opportunity for anyone who wants to join our brand, and we encourage that. And again, that's not just simply a statement, it's a statement because it's the best thing for our business. So, in diversity, uh, in your materials you indicate, I think in materials I read, that roughly almost 40, almost 50% of your workforce is diverse in one way. Is that accurate? Yes. And do you go out of your way to, to look for a diverse um, uh, employee base? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, when you look at the S&P 500, I, I believe there's a systematic, there's a global inequity that, that's, that's, that's prevalent right now. And I think you're seeing a lot of this come up. And I think there's a massive opportunity for organizations to use this moment of time to really enhance. And again, this isn't a requirement. This isn't to be legislated. This is something that can actually... I think be a, a generator for us. We have a $1.2 billion women's business. I don't feel like we get anywhere near enough credit for it. And I do believe if it were, if we had larger numbers as we continue to increase the number of, of diversity or, or especially women in leadership, I think you'll watch that number, you know, double and triple in years to come. Okay, so um, talk about the athletes. That you, when you sign up an athlete, is it a very arduous process? Let's suppose you want to get a new basketball player that's coming out of college and he's a, let's say a superstar. Um, you and two others or three others are trying to get them. How do you do that? You have to go meet with them. Uh, you have to tell them how much money you're going to pay them. You have to show them the equipment. How long does that process take? It's, it's you have to work. I mean, to have the best, but athletes are different today, you know, and again, trying to, you know, relate with a 20 something year old, you want to make sure that you're speaking to them because today's athlete is incredibly sophisticated as well as they understand they are a brand. They understand what they're bringing to the table and they have a really good understanding of what their market value is and they'll test that. But the way to win these athletes, it's not always through the front door. If you're showing up at the, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's Sun Tzu is the, you know, the victorious army attacks the defeated enemy. If you're waiting at the negotiation table for that to be done, you're going to lose. When we signed Stephen Curry, for instance, it wasn't waiting to get, be one of those three shoes with Riley. There was a guy named Ken Bazemore who was an unsigned free agent who happened to just have his locker right next to Stephen. So we signed Ken Bazemore, and then we loaded Ken with product like on a daily basis. And it was this thing where his job was to help us sign Stefan. And then eventually Stefan just said, man, if they take care of you this well, imagine what they're gonna do for me. Wow. 
and he like helped him with the understanding and that was you know you have to play you know chess with these things and certainly not checkers so but are you looking at uh, high school and college athletes all the time and seeing who's the best one with the best personality and so forth are you scouting these kind of people and getting them prime for your uh, approach I, we're always looking to find who is next. You know, I think we've been incredibly proud of that. In 2015, we had all four major U.S. sports leagues MVPs, plus the number one golfer and the number one tennis player in the world. You know, that's the kind of thing where you look at a year like that and say, can you replicate that? Remember, we're big enough as a company now that we can do anything. We're just not big enough that we can do everything. And so we have to be thoughtful. We have to be strategic is that we have to take sniper shots. And so we and our, our competitors have much greater resources than we do. But that is not an excuse. And we it's why we still compete and why we believe that we're going to be number one. Now, one of your products is new is pajamas. Yeah. Now, um, is that an athletic kind of thing or what is that? So it actually is what led to the top that you're wearing now is where what makes Under Armour unique is, of course, the styling, the fit, and moisture management, all those things that people have always taken for granted about our brand. Um, but the consumer actually wants or deserves more. And so uh, Tom Brady actually brought to us this idea of this salient lining where because the way that he's played well into his 40s is because he actually, um, when he recovers, and you've, I've seen bruised uh, knees, elbows, he uses this wrap, and he believed in, and you've seen things from those copper bands and other things out there, but this is the first, it's actually FDA proven, uh, that it increases blood flow, which helps increase the speed at which you can recover, have your muscles back faster, so when you're playing from one day to the next, you right. can actually come back that much better. And he asked if we could do a pajama line, and we introduced that, and it was something where people actively recovering at night. We said, why are they just actively recovering at night? What if we actually put it into their active wear too? So one of the things we'll be launching in the spring of 19 is something called Rush and something called Recover, which actually includes this recovery material into what you do. But you're you married. should have that sort of science project with everything. Well, you're that married is to Giselle, Harvard. you might need recovery, right? <laughs> I'm not going there. Okay, so, so um, you're very well known for having a white chalkboard in your office and you write sayings there. Is that a way that you teach people or you encourage people or motivate people? What is, what is the theory behind that? I've kept it since I started and as an athlete, this is where coaches would keep everything from depth charts to slogans or sayings. And for me, it's a place where we've always captured the real spirit and essence of the brand. And it would say things like over promise and deliver or dictate the tempo. Um, it says things like trust, you know, it's, it's built in drops and it's lost in buckets. Um, it has sort of the, the things that make and really require the, the DNA of, of what is Under Armour. Okay, so today you've built a great company and you've made a great deal of money by any normal human standards. So uh, what do you do with uh, rest and relaxation with, uh, when you're not working right now? You have money, you can travel anywhere, you can buy anything. What is the outside pleasures that you really enjoy other than interviews like this? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, love, I love driving home, parking my car, walking next door to where my kids go to school and watching my daughter play field hockey or watch my son play football or play hockey. You know, I, I think I've got a terrific family and I'm, I'm very fortunate for that. And, and to have, I think, the ability now where you get to watch it sort of play out through the eyes of kids. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy maybe being, um, being our kids is because, of course, my, my kids are required to only wear Under Armour all the time. Do they, so, are, do they suppose they were a Nike thing, what would happen? Oh, uh, that'd be bad. Yeah, that'd, be, that'd be bad. That'd be bad. Okay, they wouldn't but they wouldn't as, do that. But they, they wouldn't, wouldn't perform as well either. That's got to, I mean, I've been running their little legs, telling them, like, don't ever wear them. <laughs> More importantly, like, love, love the brand. It's important. So uh, do you have any interest in owning a sports team? You, you obviously are involved with a lot of sports teams, but would you like to own one team itself or not? I think one of the best things about my job is that um, Under, Armour get, Under Armour is undefeated. You know, we go to a game and watch two teams play, and you know, when it's nothing like watching, I was at the, the, the Northwestern Wisconsin game, and you know, you walk in one room and it's you know, ultimate you know, empathy and I'm sorry, and walk in another room and it's you know, high fives. And so that balance is something which is a lot better than living with the highs or lows, I think, of a right. team. So there's 32 you're, you're, good owners and there's uh, 30 good owners, and so the sports leagues, I think they're okay. You're very, very young uh, to be in this position. You're 46 years old. Yeah. So uh, you could do this for another 30 plus years if you wanted, but would you have any interest in going into something more important, private equity, or, um, <laughs> or would you like to run for office ever, or um, go into appointed position in government, or this is what you want to do? 
What I love is um, there's a, an old story that I've told before, which is there's nothing like this one time I was in a uh, sporting goods store out in Washington, and I'm sitting there, and, and it's four o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm watching, um, I'm watching this 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 mom walk in with uh, two little with two little kids, maybe eight and ten years old, and she's got them both in the hands, and all of a sudden the little eight-year-old just goes, "Mom, mom, look, Under Armour, Under Armour," and she starts pointing and pushing, and. Uh, uh, the kids like the mom's like, don't go over there. The stuff's expensive. Don't buy that. And the kids, I'm watching. I'm like, go oh, get away. Kid breaks away and um, he runs over. He grabs an Under Armour shirt and he pulls it over his head. And he's still wearing his school shirt. And he pulls it down over his side, sticks his arm out, and his mom's distracted with the other one. And she's trying something on with the other son, with the other boy. And uh, I watch this little kid. And his, the neck's all jammed up under his collar. And he just walks over. He just goes. He stands in the middle of the aisle, he goes, hey mom, he goes, look at me, I'm wearing Under Armour, I can do anything, like this. Well, and happened? I'm sitting there and I'm watching this happen and I just think to myself, that's brand. You know, brand is that little boy or that little girl that puts our gear on, believes that they can be a little more, they can run a little faster, jump a little higher. It may be the belief that they can make varsity, it may be the belief that, you know, they were anxious at the cafeteria and they were, you know, careful of where they were going to sit down, but today they were wearing Under Armour and they had that superpower. So hopefully, if I think about what I'd love to do is I love being able to hopefully be able to gift that superpower to anybody in the, okay. anybody in the world that gets to embrace and, and engage now, our brand. when you were uh, an athlete, you were not a superstar athlete, but now the people who are on your team who were better athletes, they come to you for jobs or? <laughs> that happens sometimes, but no, I, if, we're, if we're in the position, it's, it's sports, is, sports is, 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 I think, one of the most important training grounds. I know that I wouldn't be doing Under Armour had it not been for, you know, having played a sport and been in okay. football, and for the obvious reasons, but also for more, is that you learn team, you learn understanding. I think, you know, football is a game that is, you know, has, has great pressure on it right now, but the lessons learned, uh, an America without football would concern me a lot more than America with football. Okay. So. so a final question I'd like to ask you is, let's suppose I'm going to an athletic uh, store to buy uh, apparel, and I have, Adidas, I, I see Nike, and I see Under Armour. Why should I or anybody watching uh, buy Under Armour? Is it better? Is it less expensive? Is it going to make you a better athlete? What's, what's your presentation about why your equipment or apparel is better than your competitors? So, number one, I, I could march a dozen scientists in here and tell you why we've had 16 PhDs work on developing the fiber or fabric or construction of that product and, and the, the, the hundreds of hours of wear tests that we pour into everything that we do, the amount of focus that we have into making sure that every product is truly right. an advantage that's making someone better. And I want that to be trusted and I want that to be known, but at the end of the day I want the consumer to know that this is a brand with a soul. You know, I want them to know that this is a brand that is focused on innovation, that if it's Under Armour, it's got to be something making me right. better, that if I see you have an Under Armour logo, the first question I should ask is, is that Under Armour, well, what's it do? And the third thing is, is I, I'm really proud of our story, and I want people to be able to embrace and feel that too, when they engage with our brand, that they feel like they're a part of this, I think, amazing, one example of one of the amazing American, American stories. Well, it's a great story, and I wonder if you ever thought of signing up private equity people as endorsers, because, <laughs> You know, I mean, they, we're, we're athletes too, and we can endorse. Uh, yeah. So there might be people who might follow my endorsement. So uh, you might think about that. That's a, that's a small market with nice. us. With, with, with <laughs> big opportunity for a high right. average order value, though. Right. So we would well, thank you that. very much for good. Thank good. you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, uh, thank you.